In today's video, I'm going to briefly go over the formulas associated with circular motion. So if you have a test on this topic, you may want to write down some notes. So let's say we have an object that is moving in a circle. This object, even though it's moving in a circle at constant speed, because it's turning, it has an acceleration. This acceleration, a point it points towards the center of the circle and it's called the centripetal acceleration or AC for short. The centripetal acceleration depends on the square of the object speed divided by the radius of the circle, which we can call R. Now you can also calculate the centripetal acceleration using this formula. 4 pi squared times the radius of the circle divided by the square of the period. The period is the time it takes for this object to complete one cycle. So another way in which you can calculate the period is it's equal to the time divided by the number of cycles. That's another formula you could use to calculate the period. So for instance, let's say if a ball takes 50 seconds to go around the circle 10 times, 50 seconds divided by 10, its period is 5 seconds. It takes 5 seconds to go around the circle just once. So that's how you can calculate the period. Now the frequency is the reciprocal of the period. So the frequency is the number of cycles divided by the time. So let's say if the ball travels around the circle eight times in one second, the frequency will be eight hertz or eight seconds to the minus one. So the frequency is how many cycles it can make in one second. The period is how long it takes just to complete one cycle. So it's a point to understand the difference between the two. Now you can calculate the speed of the ball as it moves around a circle. If you take the distance around a circle, speed is gonna be distance over time. The distance around the circle is the circumference of the circle. And the circumference is two pi r. T, the time it takes to make one trip, that by definition is the period. So this is the formula that you want to use to calculate the speed. It's 2 pi r, the circumference of the circle divided by the period, since that's the time it takes to travel one cycle or, you know, one circle. Now, if you were to insert this equation and substitute it for V, you'll end up getting this equation on the right. So now you can calculate the speed at which an object orbits a circle. You can calculate the centripetal acceleration if you know the speed and the radius, but if you know the period, you can use that formula to calculate the centripetal acceleration. Now, based on Newton's second law, the net force is equal to MA. In the previous example, the only force that we had, the only acceleration that we had was the centripetal acceleration. So when you multiply the centripetal acceleration by the mass, you're going to get the centripetal force. Now, like the centripetal acceleration, the centripetal force always points towards the center of the circle. The centripetal force is equal to mv squared over r. Now imagine you have a ball attached to a rope and you're spinning it in this circle. That rope is going to have a tension force. If the circle is horizontal, so basically a circle like this, this will be more of a horizontal circle. The tension force is approximately 
equal to the centripetal force. It's mv squared over r. And this is particularly true if the speed is high. By the way, this is the velocity. The velocity is in that direction. Something I want to make sure you understand is let's say if you have a ball, it's moving this way, and the force vector is in the same direction as the velocity vector. The object will speed up if these two are aligned. If the force vector is in the opposite direction of the velocity vector, the object will slow down. But if these two vectors are perpendicular to each other, then the object will turn. And so in circular motion, the force vector and the velocity vector will always be perpendicular to each other. So here's the force vector, the centripetal force. It points towards the center of the circle and the velocity vector is perpendicular to it. At this point, the ball is going to be moving this direction, but the centripetal force will be perpendicular to it pointing towards the center of the circle. So it's going to turn again. Over here, this is where the centripetal force will be and the velocity vector. As you can see, the velocity vector is always perpendicular to the centripetal force, and that keeps the object undergoing circular motion. Now, let's go back to horizontal circles. If you have a horizontal circle and the object is spinning in a horizontal circle, when V is high, we said that the tension force is approximately equal, excuse me, equal to the centripetal force, mv squared over r. Now, when the velocity is not high, this is not going to look like a perfect horizontal circle. It's going to be slightly slanted. So it's kind of in a horizontal circle, but not exactly. Let me draw a better picture. So imagine if you have a ball attached to a rope. When you're spinning it fast, it's going to have this particular trajectory. If you're spinning it slow, it's not going to be perfectly horizontal, but it's going to be an angle. So this is going to be the tension force. That tension force is going to have a y component and an x component. And let's call this the angle theta. You're going to have this situation if you're solving the tether ball problem. Now, let's say you want to calculate the tension force. You need to realize that there's a weight force that you need to incorporate. That weight force is going to equal mg. The y component of the tension force will support the weight force. Now, notice that Tx is basically in the direction of the centripetal force. So these two will equal each other. So Tx will be equal to fc, which is mv squared over r. When v is high, tx will be much greater than ty. So t, which is going to be the square root of tx squared plus ty squared. When v is high, this term will be significantly more important than this term. So therefore, t will be approximately mv squared over r. But when V is low and you have a significant angle, then T is not going to be this. You need to use this formula to get T. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take MG, put it into this equation, and MV squared over R, I'm going to plug it in here. So we can get a new equation that will give us the tension force directly. So Tx is mv squared over r, and that is squared. Ty is mg. Now we have m squared. v squared over r, I'm going to keep that within the exponent. Now this too is m squared g squared. The reason why I wrote it out like this is so I can factor out m squared.
Now, because m squared has been factored out, the square root of m squared is m. So I can take it out and write m. And then we have g squared plus v squared over r squared. So this will give us the tension force when v is low if we know the mass of the object, the speed, and the radius of the circle. So using this formula, you don't need to calculate Tx or Ty anymore. You can just go straight to the answer. By the way, you can find these formulas in the formula sheet that I'm going to post in the description section. I won't cover all the formulas that's on that formula sheet in this video, just some of them. Now, instead of a horizontal circle, let's say we have a vertical circle. We want to calculate the tension force at these points. The tension force at the top of the circle, at point A, it's going to be mv squared over r minus mg. Those are going to be the two forces acting on the object at point A, the centripetal force and the weight force. At point C, at the bottom, the tension force is going to be at its maximum. It's mv squared over r plus mg. So you have the maximum tension force at the bottom. At the top, you have the minimum tension force. Now, at point B, which is the same as point D, the tension force will be approximately mv squared over r if v is high. So let's say v is significantly greater. Let's say the term v squared over r is significantly greater than g. So when v is very high or r is very low, um, the tension at point B and D will be approximately equal to the centripetal force. If V is not that high, then we need to use the formula that we just designed previously. So that is the tension will be M square root G squared plus V squared over R squared. So as you can see, this will incorporate the centripetal force and the weight force. So that's how you can calculate the tension force for a vertical circle at those different points. Now, let's say if you have a roller coaster and you want this roller coaster to have enough speed such that it can safely make it to the top and through this circle without losing contact with the road. The minimum speed required for this roller coaster is the square root of rg, where r is the radius of the circle and g is the gravitational acceleration, which is 9.8 meters per second squared. Now, let's say if you have a car and that car is making a turn on a flat road. This is the velocity vector and this is the centripetal force. Static friction provides the centripetal force in this example, so you can set them equal to each other. The centripetal force is mv squared over r, and that's equal to the static frictional force, which is mu s times the normal force. The normal force on a flat surface is mg. So you could cancel m, and you get v squared over r is equal to mu s times g. From this formula, sometimes when you're solving this problem, you may need to calculate the coefficient of static friction, and that's going to be V squared over RG. Other times, you need to calculate the maximum speed that this car can make the turn without skidding off the road. You just solve for V. It's going to be the square root of mu S RG. So that's the formulas you'll need to solve this particular problem. Typically, you're going to be fine in one of these two things. If you need to calculate the radius, it's just going to be V squared over mu s g.
Now, there's some other formulas on that formula sheet uh, for those of you who are interested in it. So feel free to take a look at that when you get a chance, but I'm going to stop the video here. So there's some other formulas with this topic that we can cover, but you could find it in the formula sheet. So that's going to be it for this video. Thanks again for watching.